Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 16th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss what we learned the first time through from reading Legislative Finance's overview of the governor's budget. Second, we explain the thing that surprised us most about the legislature's pre-filed bills. And third, we explain why we question whether Governor Dunleavy any longer is really serious about protecting the PFD. And now, let's join Michael. Brad, let's uh, let's dive right into it. Um, let's start off with uh, number one of the weekly top three. What have we learned uh, the first time through the legislative finances uh, overview of the governor's budget? Let's uh, let's start and take a crack at uh, at that. Well, legislative finance in advance of the session uh, publishes a summary of the governor's budget, and it's always interesting reading. For those who uh, who haven't read it before, you can find it. Uh, on the uh, ledge fine, uh, ledge fin website, uh, ledgefin.com. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's always, it's always a, a useful analysis to sort of confirm things that you think you're seeing in the governor's budget or to identify things that you really haven't noticed in the governor's budget. It also is useful to sort of identify the perspective that, um, that legis legislative finance, but remember that legislative finance is run by the Senate Finance and the House Finance Committee chairs. In the absence of a House Finance Committee chair, guess who's guess who's in the, in the ear of the legislative finance uh, director? Um, it, it's always interesting to see sort of see what they're trying to sell uh, 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 by using uh, legislative finance uh, early in the session. And, and this year, they're sort of selling the same thing early on in the, in the document. They're sort of selling the same thing they've been selling uh, for the last five years now, um, which is that uh, permanent fund dividend money is, is UGF, is unrestricted general funds, uh, and that uh, permanent fund dividends are uh, spending. And so you compare them in the legislative finance document when they do what they call the swoop chart, which is the highest categories of spending by, uh, by uh, uh, agency uh, and other categories. Uh, uh, they put the PFD in there, so it looks like it's competing against these other uh, categories uh, of spending. And they've continued that. Uh, legislative finance, it, it's really, it's always interesting to me because legislative finance essentially, though they don't say it, but they always admit in, in their documents that that treating the the PFD as as UGF revenues that are dedicated designated for the PFD treating those as UGF unrestricted general funds uh, commingled funds that you can use for any purpose they always admit that that's a lie uh, there's a footnote in their fiscal summary that says designated fund that, that talks about uh, restricted revenue and designated funds and it says designated funds which are DGF a separate category from UGF Designated funds include funds, uh, and then there's a category two fund, funds that are designated by statute for a specific purpose. Revenues designated by statute for a specific purpose. Well, there's there's no clearer designation of funds for a specific purpose, revenues for a specific purpose than the PFD statute. Um, but they just they just ignore it. 
um, as if that statute doesn't exist and recategorize uh, the permanent fund revenues uh, uh, designated by statute for the permanent fund dividend, just recategorize those as UGF. So the, it starts off with the usual sales pitch that since the time Natasha, you got to you got to figure out how all this ties together. Since right. the time Natasha went on the Senate Finance Committee, it keeps selling that same line uh, that uh, that they set it up that that, that she set it up for uh, originally. I've always wondered. I, I had wondered when she left the legislature whether they would whether they would change their tune, but they haven't. Um, it's still it's still UGF. Going through the document, there's a couple of things that I think that I think are significant. Again, thinking about this from the perspective of what legislators, what the chair of the chairs of the Senate Finance Committee, again, because there's no House Finance Committee yet, what the chairs of the Senate Finance Committee are trying to sell through legislative finance. Um, about There's a summary at the beginning, um, and about a third of the way through the summary, uh, there's a headline that says, the end of Alaska's austerity era. It has a question mark. Uh, but it, but it, it, essentially the argument in that section is that Alaska's austerity era, the era of cuts is over and that we've sort of put that behind us. And now we're going to spend a couple of fact items in there that I found significant, uh, talking about last year's budget or last session's budget, which was a combination of the FY 23 budget and the FY 22 supplemental. These items totaling 602 million contributed to ballooning statewide items figure above. Now keep in mind the budget's broken down into the operations budget, the agency operations budget, statewide items and capital. And this is talking about the statewide items. These items totaling 602 million contribute to the ballooning statewide items figure above, but the growth rates would still be unsustainable without them, even excluding these Items and they're talking about one-time items. What the governor described in his uh, budget message when he issued the few vetoes he did and right. signed the budget, even excluding these one-time one-time items, the pre-PFD budget would still have increased by twenty-three point one percent. And so that's they're using that as sort of the kickoff fact for uh, uh, for the fact that uh, uh, that we've reached the uh, end of the austerity era. Then they go to talking about uh, the governor's budget, and it says, overall, the governor's budget proposes relatively few major changes to agency budgets. The most significant change is a proposed increase to Medicaid of $20.7 million for a combination of expected utilization and inflationary changes, as well as to expand postpartum coverage. So... In it again with the theme of the end of the austerity era, building that up as the theme that we put that past us now. In talking about the governor's budget, they emphasize that the governor's budget has very few changes, and where there are major changes, it's to increase Medicaid spending uh, of all things. One of the things that that <laughs> we've we've talked long and hard about about being an area that you could decrease, but the governor's right. budget increases. So. Uh, I just want to interrupt real quick to say, so you're saying their justification for more spend is the fact that they have spent more. Yes. That, that's the, the justification for future spend is, look, we've already increased, so why bother to go back, essentially, is what you're saying. Because, look, we just increased by 23%, so we should just keep, so we should stop, is, is what you're saying. Stop trying yeah. to go. Well, we have stopped. I think I think what they're trying to do is state it as a, it's sort of like, it's sort of like in 2017, when they stated that the PFD is is unrestricted general fund revenues, thank you very much, and and we're going to compare it's a, a the PFDs are state spending, and we're going to compare it to others. It, it it's sort of like you know we're we're gonna we're gonna say it so, and thus it is so, right? That's 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 sort of the tactic of of some of these ledge finance documents. You know, if if ledge right. finance, a bi bipartisan uh, 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 expert. Uh, agency, if, if ledge finance says it so, it must be so. Um, you know, this comes out of the old David Teal era. If David Teal said it so, it must be so. Right. Um, and so they're saying, well, end of the austerity era. Look at these facts. It must be so. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and sort of, it sort of try to win by assumption, right? Win by assumption and, and, and statement of fact that really isn't fact, but 
state statement of uh, statement of uh, assumption of fact. Um, and then um, uh, the governor goes on for or the budget goes on for other identifying other areas uh, where uh, uh, the governor's budget increases. The governor's budget didn't get all of the tax credits, the oil and gas tax credits, reimbursable tax credits purchased last year because oil prices went down. So there's an additional sum now included in this budget, essentially a rollover, if you will, from the last budget into this budget of the purchase of the final uh, oil and gas tax credits. Um, and then talks about the capital budget. And the capital budget has been uh, has increased over prior capital budgets. Uh, the 10-year plan now shows nearly a hundred million dollar increase from what prior capital budgets had shown on a on a going forward basis. And uh, the the ledge fund explains that as the majority of the UGF and the governor's capital budget is used for federal match. 171.3 million of the 276. Uh, 0.4 million total is for this purpose. This is $19 million increase from the FY23 budget. And then it increases in the out years as well. And basically what it's telling us is, is all of the federal money that's coming into the state. Guess what? It ratchets up state money also, <laughs> because in order right. to get that federal money, we have to have state match money. And that increases the state capital budget in order to, uh, in order to, to do that. So, um, there's one other thing that I think is useful. The the like it did last year. Uh, the uh, the ledge finance uh, uh, document talks or summary talks about uh, revenues, additional revenues or new revenues, and it says the following options are reflective of common practice in other states, but do not constitute a policy recommendation. Equity, economic impacts, efficiency, and other considerations are not presented here, but should be addressed if the legislature chooses to explore revenue options. Well, here's another thing that happens as a result of moving the PFD to UGF and treating it as spending. The PFD cuts don't get included in this category. And so you've got a situation where you're looking at these other taxes and you're saying, you know, generally people say taxes are bad. But you're not comparing them to the PFD because they've moved the PFD over to the spending category right. by including the revenues in UGF. And they're not One including the economic impact of that, essentially. Right. They right. avoid that they avoid that they avoid that issue entirely through the trick of treating the PFD as as part of UGF and not treating it as as an alternative revenue source and comparing it to other alternative revenue sources. The final, the final thing in here um, uh, that I think is worth noting is a confirmation, uh, basically a confirmation of some of the calculations we've been doing. It says, Ledge Finance uh, estimates an individual income tax based on uh, uh, AGI, uh, adjusted gross income, a flat income tax of 3% with no exemptions or discussions or deductions would generate 900 million in the first half, in the first full year administered. So basically, they're saying the same thing we've been saying, which is you could you you could solve you solve the deficit that we've been solving by this hugely regressive PFD cuts could be solved instead through a three percent flat tax. And I found some comfort. I don't recall seeing that in last year's document. I found some comfort in the fact that their calculations are lining up with our calculations. Um, and that we're both showing about a three that, that the that the number we ought to, you know, some people talk about, oh my God, there'd be a 10%, 12% income tax. That'd be horrible. Well, the, the number we ought to be talking about is is th is a three percent flat tax. That's the comparable number to uh the heavily regressive PFD cuts that uh that the legislature has been adopting the last few and the governor's been signing the last few years. So I I I found that to be a to be a useful number. Two things to uh, continue to contribute to this before we run out of time. First, Donna Ardwin's in the chat room. She says, Brad, did you notice the uh, report says it makes no difference whether the PFD is paid out of the ERA or the general fund? That there's there's a forced disconnect. And that seems to be embraced now that no longer are they wanting to pay it out of the ERA and general fund. And that, again, just continues to reinforce that separation. Uh, between the actual dividend and the fact that they're saving it as general fund money. They've been saying that all throughout. It, it's, that, that was part of the 2017 change, uh, that, it's, that, it's, that it's not designated funds and it makes no difference the source of the funds. That any, yeah. it, it's, it's UGF spending. 
Uh, and Brian, uh, Brian in the chat room says, for those of us who aren't as brilliant as yourself, please place this into some sort of context and explain how this is fixable. Uh, how, do, how do we fix it? I mean, you're giving us a lot of good details here, but put it in, dumb it down, talk to me like I'm five, and then tell me how to fix it. I mean, that's that's where we're at right now. Well, the, the fix is what we've been spot- talking about all along, which is to treat the UG, uh, treat the PFD as designated funds, either statutorily designated, which is what they are, uh, or constitutionally set them aside, but treat them as, as the funds designated for special purposes they are. Once you do that, once you do that, you see what the huge what the remaining ugf revenues are and what the fiscal gap is the remaining fis- the fiscal gap uh that the that the state has to close and then by treating them as as designated funds bringing them from designated funds into ugf to supplement ugf would be treated as a revenue and then you compare them to all the other revenues and you see that the pfd is as as icer told us in 2016 as itep told us in 2017, and as no one has said any difference since that time, you see that that using PFDs, PFD cuts to close the gap has the largest adverse impact on Alaska, on 80% of Alaska families, and on and on the overall Alaska economy. So that one trick, that trick that 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 happened, I'll just say contemporaneous with Natasha joining the legislature, that one trick uh, of moving. The, uh, the, 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 the PFD over to unrestricted general funds and treating it as spending that one trick, undoing that sort of unlocks, you know, getting at the, at the, at the, at the correct solution, seeing the true fiscal gap unadulterated by the diversion of PFD funds and then comparing uh, the use of PFD funds to close that gap against, uh, against alternative revenues. That really is the crux of this whole problem. And I think we've talked about it before, but you're just highlighting it again, Brad. The second that they stop treating the PFD like it, it was a designated, you know, fund, like the original intent was that it had first call, that it was not, it was simply a pass through. It was not a revenue, so, you know, any of those things. That was the beginning of the end for the permanent fund dividend as we know it, because that that changed everything. Then it had to fight on some kind of equal playing field and it became the cookie jar that everybody wanted to put their hand in. Yeah. The second, the second they treated the, they treated all of the, all of, all of the uh, earnings reserve funds coming to the, all of the permanent fund fund earnings reserve coming to the, coming to the budget. The second they treated all of those as UGF and they second, they included the PFD in the, in the swoop chart. And, and for those of you who are interested in what the swoop chart is, go to legislative, go to the legislative finance uh, website, look for their summary of, uh, of the governor's budget. And then the swoop chart sort of looks, well, looks like a swoop. I mean, it starts with the highest uh, spending categories. Like I said, I need to get down to get in the frame. Highest spending categories and then swoops down to the lowest spending categories. Um, uh, the second they put the, the PFD in there, what happens is the PFD just dwarfs everything else and it looks like the, the it, it does exactly what natasha wanted it makes it look like the pfd is the source of the state's fiscal problem um she did, she couldn't change the law they couldn't change the pfd statute um and so they just ignored it and just started making crap up um about what the budget looked like ignoring the uh, ignoring the pfd status as a as a designated uh, designated revenue source. That was, Teal was part of that deal. Uh, Bert was part of that deal. Natasha was part of that deal. Uh, Neil Foster, though he'll now deny it, was, was part of that deal uh, in order to, to, to set up the, the budget that way. And everything they've built since then, every justification for cutting the BFD, every justification for, you know, funding it from other unrestricted general fund sources, because after all, it's just unrestricted general fund spending. Everything they've done since that time stems from the 2017 decision to to treat it as uh, to treat it as as unrestricted general funds and to put it in the swoop chart. So, yeah, that's 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 the source of the problem. And then everything builds from that. And now this year, the, the assumed fact is that we've hit the end of the austerity area. No more. No. no. I mean, the governor's budget sort of tells you that, too. The go- if the if the only major action in the governor's budget is to increase Medicaid sp- Medicaid spending, you you know you know that battle is is we're, we're losing that battle big time, right? Uh, but you know to to just state as fact, end of austerity era, end of the Alaska austerity era, 
Um, yeah. And I have to laugh. Austerity. I mean, <laughs> okay. I mean, largest budgets, you just look at the ever increasing amounts of budgets. Yeah, there's a lot of austerity baked into that thing. And they've been telling us for six years, they just can't possibly cut anything else out of the budget. Sure, we've had a lot of austerity. Uh, I mean, it's just they what they want is just unrestricted spending. That's well, what they want. I mean, the theme, the theme, this this legislature is going to be uh, on K through 12 spending. We're going to hear over and over and over and over, which is we we have had K through 12 cuts. The failure to include an inflation adjustment is is cutting K through 12 spending. Um, and, and we're just going to hear that until, you know, we're nauseated by it. But that's going to be the theme that we have had cuts, and now, and now that that we've gotten to this point, it's the end of the austerity era. Yeah, we don't have big oil revenues anymore, but look, we got this whole bunch of PFD money that we're now going to treat as, yeah. as unrestricted. Well, and Rob, Rob Meyer says the end of austerity during falling oil prices. I mean, that's you know, that makes a whole lot of sense. And then Donna chimes in again, even using their own SB 26 law, the only part of the ERA that should be in the UGF is the amount of the POMV left after transferring the statutory amount to the dividend. But they continue to ignore that. I mean, they just, why even bother having laws, Brad? Because they're going to do whatever the hell they want. That's kind of the whole thing. Hashtag follow the damn law. Nope, doesn't work. And, and part of the key of that, part of the key to that is controlling is controlling ledge finance because ledge finance, I mean, if you read the news reports and you follow the reporters, they all sort of treat ledge finance as God, right? As the, as the un, you know, nonpartisan expert body. So he who controls ledge finance <laughs> controls the world basically is what's, is what's going on here. And, and I know, I know that OMB has tried to beat that back, especially when Donna was head of o OMB. And I know revenue has tried to beat that back, but they don't do a very good job at it. I mean, last year, was it last year or the year before, uh, that Bert's first question out of the box to Neil Steiner, the, the, the successor OMB director, was, do you agree that there's a conflict between SB 26 and, and the PFD statute? The answer to that is no, I don't agree that there's a conflict. Steiner's answer was yes. And once you do that, once you agree to that, you just go down, you just go down a slippery slope. We're continuing now, Brad Keithley, our guest, Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three. We're on to number two. I don't know if we get to number three. We're going to try our best. Number two is the surprises. Brad uh, said there's some interesting things to learn from the pre-files uh, with some surprises in there. Brad, uh, what say you? Uh, I, the surprises were by omission. There were very few fiscal policy bills included in the pre-file. Uh, Will Akowski had his usual constitutional amendment uh, to constitutionalize the PFD. Um, but all of the other uh, uh, fiscal policy pre-files that I could find were basically versions of spending caps. Not None of the bills, none of the pre-file bills appeared to be embodiments of the fiscal of the of the proposal put forward by the fiscal policy working group to the multi-pronged solution as they called it the comprehensive solution to the state's fiscal issues none of the bills seem to capture that the only fiscal policy bills other than Wilikowski's PFD amendment uh, it was uh, was was spending caps of the spending caps the one that appears to be the one to to to, to follow closely is Jim Kaufman's new sen former representative, now Senator James Kaufman's um, uh, proposed spending cap that that is based on GDP. It's a it's a it's it sets the spending cap at a certain percentage of GDP, and basically because the Alaska GDP is driven so much by oil prices, oil values. I mean that's our biggest export, right? Oil, and so that's you know the value of the exported oil really drives the GDP. Really, it's an indirect way of setting the spending cap uh, uh, based on oil values, oil prices. Um, and that, and that, and I say that's the one that appears to be the one to follow because Gary Stevens, um, at some point, either in the, um, uh, the Senate majority availability, press availability yesterday or in a separate conversation, uh, said to the KTUU reporters, the KTUU reporters, right? Um, that uh, he's intrigued by Kaufman's bill and thinks that that's one that the, that the legislature, the Senate at least, 
we'll take a close look at. I've got problems with Kaufman's bill. I mean, it's like, it's like all of the other bills that aren't related to actual revenues, right? It has the ability to sort of spin off on its own over time as right. revenues, as we know, traditional revenues are going down as oil prices go down. That would sort of follow it because because being based on GDP it would follow oil values, but it wouldn't follow it very closely, and and so as traditional revenues would go down, spending would sort of would sort of continue bouncing along, and the gap between the two, uh, just like we talked about last week, would expose you know create this cage match, this MMA cage match where it'd be the PFD and uh, and uh, and other spending categories that would fight it out while the top 20% stood on the outside laughing all the way to the bank. So it's, these, I I was surprised by the failure of anybody to really try to put together a package um, and, and get that out there in front for, uh, for discussion. Well, and and I think that's the problem with many of these these spending caps is, you know, either they're statutory, which means they can just ignore them as they have in the past. They've passed spending caps and then busted them in the same session, or it's so disconnected from the actual uh, revenue in the state that it becomes within just a handful of years, it becomes irrelevant and and means nothing. And that's the danger here is they want to look like they're doing something, um, but in the long run, it doesn't do anything to fix the actual problem. Yeah, you you hit the nail on the head. What the, the real concern I have about about all this focus on spending caps is that what people are going to say is, well, we did a spending cap. You know, we passed Kaufman's or we passed somebody's. We did a spending cap. Now we've solved the fiscal situation. Let's go on. Well, no, you haven't, because you've just set the PFD up for a cage match with 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 other spending. You haven't solved the fiscal problem. You've solved it for the top twenty percent, because now they've got spending cap. They don't have to worry about spending rising to a level where you have to go get other revenues, but you've just left the PFD out there exposed uh, to being used as the funding source uh, for uh, for the increasing budget gaps that we're going to be experiencing. So it's, um, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It's, 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 let's do, like, you, you, they're trying to set it up to say, let's do one thing and claim that we've solved it all. And they haven't. And, and so that's, I mean, that's the real, that's the real problem that we're facing. All right, number three, quickly here. We got about four minutes. Um, is Governor Dunleavy serious about prof- about protecting the PFD? Uh, I guess that's the big question here. I mean, it would look like it on the surface since he proposed a big four thousand dollar PFD, but is he really serious about protecting it? Yeah, exactly right, Michael. And 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 here's and here's where that question arises. We know even his tenure his ten year plan says there's going to be continued deficits, right? What's what's the revenue source he's proposed uh, to fill those deficits? Well, it's the pie in the sky carbon credits, and I and and there's one headline in in the Wall Street Journal today that just captures everything about carbon credits. It says many companies are shying away from carbon cre- carbon credits. Uh, so you know, just at the time the governor Dunleavy is trying to sell these as the as the be all and end all as the solution to the state's fiscal problem, we get a Wall Street Journal headline that says, "Yeah, not so fast. I, companies are." Are, are running the other direction from them. it's a fake it's a fake revenue source and without a real rep without putting forward a real revenue source to fill in that to fill in what we can see are going to be the continuing fiscal gap all he's doing is exposing the pfd to additional cuts deeper and deeper and deeper cuts so you know from from a very real angle and i'm and i'm writing this for this week's friday column in the landmine from a very real perspective Dunleavy's putting on a good face, sort of, by saying we're going to have four thousand dollar PFDs, we're going to pay a full statutory PFD. But when you when you pull up that when you pull that up and look underneath about what's supporting that, there's no there's nothing there. It's fake revenues. So I I I really question at the end of the day whether whether Dunleavy is really supporting the PFD. If he was, he'd be you know looking at at further spending cuts as opposed to. 20 million increase 20 million dollar increases in Medicaid and he would be looking at a real revenue source real revenue sources and he's got plenty out there his Department of Revenue has told him where they are at real revenue sources that would help fill the gap without exposing the PFD to it so I, there's a real question in my mind whether Dunleavy honestly truly uh, is supporting uh, is supporting the PFD when it comes right down to it well, because now he can kind of wash his hands, right? Oh, I've done it. I've put it out there. And now it's on the legislature. So in some ways, he's kind of passed the buck 
uh, by trying to do it, but really giving them no other out other than to cut the PFD. I mean, because they're, I mean, the, these fictional carbon tax credit revenues, which may or may not appear, and especially probably won't appear to the degree to which he says, uh, you know, he's kind of, you know, shielded himself from that kind of criticism in that way. You know, we need to go back to the to the fiscal year 20 or the fiscal year 21 Dunleavy. And the fiscal year 21 done, uh, 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 tenure plan, Department of Revenue or OMB tenure, tenure plan, it talked a lot about a balanced approach, some spending cuts, some uh, alternative revenues, and, and PFD restructuring to POMB 50-50. Adding those three together, a little bit from each, taking a little bit, bit from each category, uh, in order to fit together a plan. That was the FY21 uh, Dunleavy 10-year uh, plan. Now the, the FY24 Dunleavy, Dunleavy plan is no longer that. Forget that. We're just going to rely on fake revenues. And we're going to say that, you know, it balances out there by, through all these fake through all these fake revenues without having to do uh, without having to do PFD cuts, we, we need we need him to go back to the governor he was, as opposed to this you know mealy mouth governor that he's uh, becoming in the second term. It's just another example, Brad, uh, of again, uh, you know they say one thing. It's like the pod people they go down to uh, they go down to Juno and they forget what they were th- you know what they were pointing out. Uh, and I'm um, uh, you know if if you really, really meant it, and now you're a lame duck, you could do whatever you want, essentially. You know, I mean, you may face a recall, but you're a lame duck. Now would be the time to get had on, you know, to get to get on top of this and really just, you know, hammer down on it. And he didn't do it. He just, you know, he just, again, passes the buck, shields himself and says, uh, we're going to I'm doing my best. And uh, not threatening to use the vetoes, not, you know, not really uh, putting out an aggressive budget. It's, I mean, it, it's so frustrating to watch. It is, Michael, and 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 he's got it. I mean, he had it in in the fiscal year twenty one ten year plan. He had the solution. It's the same solution that two years later the fiscal policy, the legislature's fiscal policy working group came up with. A little bit of this, a little bit of PFD restructuring to go to POMB fifty fifty. A little bit of spending cuts, nothing, nothing huge like he proposed in the initial year, but some spending cuts, and a little bit of additional revenues. And 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 of those additional revenues, a portion of it can come could come from you know things like fixing the Hillcorp glitch, which is about a hundred million dollars, uh, and some adjustments to uh, to oil taxes to you know bring oil taxes up to up to current standards. Um, and you know, and, and then a little bit of additional revenues on the side. It's like, but it's like, I don't want to, you know, Dunleavy is, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about additional revenues unless right. they're painless revenues, like these right. fictional carbon credit revenues. Then I'll talk about them all day long. Right. And, you know, and I'll put huge numbers on it, but I don't want to talk about real things. Right. And, and, and he did that. They did that. The administration did that. The FY21 uh, uh, fiscal plan. And, and we're just, I mean, now he's wandering off in some direction that, I, you know, I don't know. And the, the end of austerity, the end of austerity era, um, and the, and the beginning of the elimination of the PFD era is basically where we're, where we're wandering off to now. Yeah, no. And that is frustrating, especially since we've talked about things like, you know, the Hill Corp thing and additional taxes, uh, you know, uh, and, a, and a refreshing of the taxation on the oil company, you know, taking and bringing some of that money to the table. I mean, between those two fixes alone, you know, you could have four or five hundred million dollars easily and then other revenue sources that have been identified. But again, it has to be a holistic approach, like the fiscal policy working group said. And nobody really is talking about any of that. That, that it's always a one it's always a one lever solution yeah and 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 there's reasons for that i suppose but i was i i gotta admit i was really disappointed uh, that that we didn't see any of that in the pre-files we we only saw these single these single these single point solutions we didn't see any of the of the comprehensive package that the last legislature i mean this was the last legislature that did it and and there are still those people. The, there are still people in that legislature that are the, in that in the fiscal policy working group that were reelected and coming back into this session. Nobody really bringing that together and putting that, you know, laying that down as a groundwork. If they'd done that, if the governor had gone back to the FY twenty one uh, uh, ten year plan and said, "Look, we need a balanced approach. We need a little bit of here, a little bit of here, a little bit of here," 
we would have had both a legislative solution that that some would have proposed and the governor advocating that solution and we and we could be talking about that but now you know we're having to talk about this, these fictional revenues coming from uh, coming from carbon credits that not even wall street buys yeah so have you, uh, uh, Rob Myers in the chat room says, uh, Kaufman's cap and mine keep the PFD outside the cap. Both are also constitutional, not statutory. Have you had a chance to compare the two of them, Kaufman's and, and Myers, and take a look at either one? I mean, is there going to be some discussion on them? Yeah, I mean, the discussion is going to be on Kaufman's because that's what the majority, Kaufman's in the majority, and that's what Stephen seems to be latched onto. I don't know if that was the deal for getting Kaufman in the majority or exactly how... Uh, uh, how that how that came to be, but the Kaufmans is the one. They keep they keep the PFD outside the cap, but that really doesn't solve the problem. I mean, if you don't have additional revenues uh, uh, inside the cap, then where are you going to go for the go for the revenues that that are showing up uh, showing up inside or for the the fiscal gap, the deficits that are still showing up uh, inside the ga- the cap. So even though you technically sort of keep them outside, they still get drugged back inside the cage. Because right. there's no other revenue source to be talking about. Uh, Brad, uh, we're down to the last minute here, so a minute and a half. Um, what are we? What should we be looking for? What should we be watching? What are you going to be watching this coming uh, week here as the organization continues and everything else? What you know? What what, what should we be watching for? It, it'll be. It, I'm going to watch the House organization because the Senate clearly is going to is going to go off on a tangent. They're clearly going to. Uh, increase K through 12 spending. They're clearly going to uh, do defined benefits, uh, at least for teachers. And then, as we've said before, others will come come in behind that. They're clearly going to do other things that I think have have price tags on them. And so, the House organization, the House, and it doesn't look like Dunleavy is going to act you know, as much as a, as much of a barrier to, to you know if the Senate gets on a roll and has all these spending bills. It doesn't look like Dunleavy is going to act like much of a much of a break on that. So I think I think really need to focus on the House organization and how the House comes together, who they put in charge of the Finance Committee, uh, who they, uh, what policies they announce that they're going to have as a as a body, wh- whoever organizes the uh, the House. I think that's I think that's become more critical than I first gave it gave its importance because of Dunleavy's, uh, you know, round what we've talked about in the past is round heel heels is his willingness to sway back and just let the legislature do whatever it wants to do. And Brian says, finally, sidebar, any music events we should be watching for, Brad? (laughs) Yes, there are a lot. Go to the Anchorage Concert Association, Laura Cortese and the Dance Cards is one heck of a group. They're appearing both in Anchorage and in Fairbanks. If you have a chance to go, go watch them. One of my favorite groups in music. All right, Brad Keithley, thank you, my friend. Appreciate you coming on board and joining us. Thank you for being part of it today. As always, Michael, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.